Okay, good morning. I think we'll get started uh, with our next session here. And uh, we've had an exciting morning so far uh, with our uh, FDA representatives. What a wonderful session. So we're going to go to our next session right now, which is uh, the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic, standing at the precipice. And I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, Alpha Med Press for sponsoring this session, and also uh, Ann Murphy and her staff for the wonderful work they do at the journal Stem Cells Translational Medicine. That's the official journal of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation and GPI. So it's great to have all of you here, and uh, we really do have an uh, absolutely wonderful panel today of experts who really are going to give us a very good introduction about some of the challenges that we're facing as well as some of the current opportunities for our field. Our first speaker for the panel is Dr. John Kurtzberg, who's a director uh, of the unit at Duke University Medical Center. She has been a pioneer in the area of stem cells and has been uh, leading the way treating patients uh, with core blood stem cells for many years. Has, was one of the original uh, scientists working on assays that could detect uh, strength for core blood cells, as well as really advancing the field for patients uh, and the science. So it really gives me a great pleasure to introduce her to you, and we will have uh, three short uh, presentations followed by the panel discussion. Thank you, Joanne, for being with us today. Can you hear me okay? Good. Well, thank you, um, Tony and Bernie, for inviting me. And I'm happy to talk with you today. And I'm going to give you perspectives about uh, trying to do stem cell research and cellular therapies and translational research from the perspective of an academic uh, translational researcher, which is what I am. And I'm going to focus on cord blood because that's what I work with in my uh, core business um, and give you a little history. And I think the cord blood story illustrates a lot of important points that I'll come to as I go through the talk. Um, first off, though, the cord blood story started in 1988 with a transplant of a related sibling matched cord blood in a little boy with Fanconi anemia. The transplant was done in France um, by Elaine Gluckman, who's shown in the white coat. But um, the child came from North Carolina and was my patient at Duke when I was a fellow. Vanconi anemia is a fatal disease where the blood system fails and leukemia develops, and most children die by the age of 10. Um, this child developed bone marrow failure, happened to have a mom who was pregnant. We tested the baby in utero and found the baby was not affected and was a match and um, collected the cord blood when the baby was born in a bottle with some heparin, <laughs> nothing elegant, um, and Hal Broxmeyer froze it in his research lab, and they all went to France for the transplant. Unfortunately, it was successful and paved the way for the field, and you can see him with me 27 years later in the blue shirt. I don't know if I can point. Um, and um, he's doing well and fortunately has had no other consequences of Fanconi anemia and most importantly is durably engrafted with his baby sister's cord blood cells. So that was proof that cord blood contained hematopoietic stem cells capable of rescuing marrow um, and really paved the way for the field. And I'll point out that this was a first-in-man experiment. It was in a child. There was very little preclinical data um, in this traditional way that we would get it today. Um, but we did have a backup alginate bone marrow donor, so it wasn't done in a reckless fashion. Um, but I always think that if we started over again, um, it, it would be a much more difficult pathway to get um, to the point we are today. Um, so um, over the years of cord blood development, it was demonstrated that cord blood contains hematopoietic stem cells, which are capable of restoring hematopoiesis after myeloablative therapy. Public cord blood banks were established, and FDA issued guidance uh, for licensure of public banks, and this is really the first hematopoietic stem cell product to be required to be licensed um, in 2011. And there are now five licensed banks in the US, including the one that I run at Duke. Um, there have been early phase clinical trials um, also, and I'll describe a few in using autologous cord blood uh, in children with brain injury. and um, 
Uh, I'll show you a first-in-man clinical trial that we're doing with a product that's a microglial type cell that we're deriving from cord blood. Um, we, in our developmental plan, are moving into the allogeneic arena because um, uh, many children are not going to have autologous cord blood available, and if this is effective, we want to make it available to all patients in need. Um, so cord blood is a hematopoietic stem cell source, just a couple of comments. So it's an alternative donor and hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for patients who don't have a matched related or unrelated donor in their family or a registry. Um, the unrelated donor banks have established um, sort of self-governance with accreditation, um, which is provided through two different organizations, FACT and ABB. As I mentioned, FDA has now um, uh, mandated licensure of cord blood banks. Um, there's a banking network through HHS, managed through HRSA, I'll describe, um, and a registry and an outcomes database that all centers using cord bloods uh, for transplantation report to. And this is a little bit different um, way to manage a product than the FDA was used to because the individual licensed bank is not going to each transplant center. There are hundreds around the world that use these units to get the outcomes data. The outcomes data is reported to a registry that's federally funded. Reporting in the U.S. is uh, federally mandated. And um, uh, then that outcomes database sends the outcomes data back to the bank. There's also a real-time um, system for ADE and SAE reporting. Um, this just shows you the CW Bill Young uh, Cell Transplantation Program, which is under HHS, has an advisory council, and uh, is managed through HRSA's Division of Transplantation, and um, in addition, cooperates with the accrediting agencies, but has a formal network of unrelated donor cord blood banks called the National Cord Blood Inventory, um, a cord blood coordinating center, an adult donor coordinating center, a registry, which is a single access uh, registry that lists all bone marrow and adult donors and cord blood donors and provides uh, searches to transplant centers and patients. And then this outcomes database, which is a contract awarded to the uh, University of Milwaukee called the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research. And through this centralized web-based network, all transplant centers report outcomes of all types of hematopoietic stem cell transplants, which again can then be centrally reviewed and also provided to uh, banks and transplant centers. So I, I mention all this because I think as we think about applying regenerative medicine more broadly and reply, applying cell therapy more broadly, um, I've certainly been involved in conversations about how are we going to get the outcomes data and how are we going to be able to track it and how are we going to know what's happening. And I, I don't think, similar to what um, Dr. Caleb said, I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. These systems exist, they can be expanded, and there are good prototypes for going forward in the next stages of cell therapies. I'm going to switch gears and show you a little of our own work um, in um, uh, using hematopoietic stem cells to correct uh, inborn errors of metabolism through allogeneic myeloablative transplantation. And these are genetic diseases where um, children die in the first decade of life without treatment, where multiple organs are affected besides the blood, but where you can correct the disease if you get engraftment of donor cells that are permanently engrafted and essentially afford a form of donor enzyme replacement. They also migrate to the brain and replace enzyme in the brain, which is something that right now drugs do not do well. Um, we've demonstrated that this is a viable therapy in multiple inborn errors. They're listed here. And in the red line, you can see that survival is greatly improved if children are transplanted early in the course of the disease. So that's 80% at about 11 years post-transplant. Um, and again, children transplanted early uh, have good functional outcomes. Um, the thing to remember from this, though, is that children are getting myeloablative chemotherapy and donor cells have to permanently engraft. So this is a risky procedure. It's not undertaken lightly. Um, and um, it's only done when a disease is known to be lethal without treatment and also when there's an evidence of cross-correction of healthy cells by damaged cells in vitro. 
Um, this is just an example of one child undergoing the procedure. This is a child with late infantile crabe disease, a deficiency of galactocerebral cytase, which uh, prevents myelination of the brain. This child's sibling died at two and a half years of age, and that's how the family learned that they carried the disease. This little boy was picked up pre-symptomatically and um, is getting his line changed. All kids get a central line. They're in the hospital two months, and they take a good 12 to 18 months to completely recover from the procedure. His little brother is shown in the upper right, also diagnosed with the same disease and transplanted. And here they are 10 years later, um, doing well, um, functionally normal. Um, but essentially, the diagnosis was because of the older brother's uh, passing. Um, Hurler syndrome is another example of a disease that has very successful outcomes with hematopoietic cell transplantation. And we showed in Hurler syndrome years ago that cognitive function, which is falling off in the first few years of life in the dotted lines, recovers in kids that are transplanted under the age of two. And again, you have to say, well, what's happening in the brain to, make, to permit this to occur? And I don't think it's completely understood, but I'll show you a little more data. Now, um, we took our observations from kids in, uh, with genetic diseases who had brain problems that could be corrected with transplant and said maybe we can also look at application of cells in, in regenerative medicine and brain injury. Um, and that's the work that we're doing now. Um, so we have looked at autologous or the child's own infusion of cord blood cells for brain repair in kids who are not genetically abnormal but who have some insult in pregnancy or around birth that result in brain injury later on. And this would include in utero stroke or perinatal hypoxic injury. And we have several trials completed or ongoing and, as I mentioned, um, are also moving into um, the allogeneic sphere. So the process is that we actually took concepts developed that we developed based on clinical needs access to patients who told us, we want you to try to help us. Um, we had to learn how to qualify source materials. And what I mean by this is cord blood units that were banked in family banks um, who are not regulated. And we had to essentially develop a qualification scheme that we felt comfortable with that meant that the cord blood unit was safe, not contaminated, had enough cells, and that the cells were alive, and that that cord blood unit came from that child. Um, we're generally treating rare disorders, so we sometimes face challenges with patient numbers um, and getting enough patients to really do uh, statistically powerful uh, studies. And the endpoints are complicated. When you do a standard hematopoietic stem cell transplant for leukemia, you care about it in grafting, you care about did it cure the leukemia, and you care about complications like graft versus host disease. And they're very standardized ways to measure those. But when you treat a child with cerebral palsy, the endpoints are very different. And um, it's much harder to responsibly develop scientific trials that actually prove or disprove that your intervention is working. Um, and um, we're still working on that as well. Um, and um, I want to emphasize that here, the effects are not dependent on engraftment. We're not giving these kids chemotherapy. We're just giving them an infusion of cells. So the risk is much lower, but the cells are exerting trophic effects that we only partially understand. But that's how we think they ex uh, exert their activity. Um, so here you can see some of the subtypes we're interested in. Cord blood has mononuclear cells. That's still a very mixed bag of uh, cells, you know, everybody talks about cord blood stem cells, but in a billion cells, there are probably 20 stem cells. Um, and the rest of the cells are blood progenitors and occasional other progenitors of other lineages. Uh, we have uh, focused on the brain and have preclinical work that shows that CD14 cells are active, and I'll show you one cell we derived from that population that um, has exciting properties. So this is the same picture, but I want to show you that in in vitro systems, the mononuclear cells mediate hypoxia. CD14 cells mediate hypoxia in a positive way. But um, the cell we derive from CD14 cells is the one that actually promotes myelination. Um, so we developed this cell called DUOC from a hypothesis I'll show you in the clinic. And, uh, I'm not going to go through the details on this slide, but we had to go through all the things you go through for drug manufacturing um, in order to get an IND and um, get the cells into the clinic. And 
in an academic institution, we were really speaking a foreign language and we were learning as we went along the way and um, really had to you know, bring in new infrastructure in order to make this happen. So um, again, we, we um, observed in the upper left that when you treat infants with early infantile Carvet disease in the first month of life with a transplant in the red line, survival at 15 years is 90%. Um, and function was improved if kids were transplanted very early. Um, the next two panels show you just um, the corticospinal tracts of two such children, and you can see, or you have to believe me, that the one on the left is normal, and the one on the right is skinny and underdeveloped, and that child on the right, even with a transplant early in life, will have trouble walking. Uh, we demonstrated in the third panel that cells do get to the brain from the donor. These are male cells in a female child's brain 10 months after transplantation when she unfortunately died of uh, Crabbe because she was symptomatic at transplant. But Evan Snyder took these pictures and demonstrated cells in the brain. And we then went back to the lab and said, can we make that into a product for therapeutics? and um, developed the uh, culture techniques to grow a cell we call DUOC, Duke O-cell. Um, and on the green on the right is a, a brain of a mouse that was given cuprazone to demyelinate the corpus callosum and then was rescued with this cell. And the green staining there is myelin basic protein showing remyelination of the brain induced by the cell. So we then embarked on a clinical trial which takes a cord blood unit um, allows the big part in the middle to be used for the standard transplant of the child, and that's an actual baby who underwent treatment on this protocol with early infantile Crabbe disease. So that is used after high-dose chemotherapy to rescue the hematopoietic system. But the small part of the, cell, the compartment of the cordial unit um, is put into the GMP lab, and the DOC cells are derived in 21 days of culture. And then assuming the child's engrafted without GVHD, the child is given an, an augmenting dose of these cells into the spinal fluid on day 28 post-transplant. And um, I don't have time to tell you, but every step of the way we had to determine you know, potency, stability, sterility, how to grow the cells with things that could go into the spinal fluid. And, and it was an adventure, I'll say. But we have this now in the clinic. Five children have been treated. It's too early to say anything about efficacy if we can, but we can say it's safe in those five children. Um, we're also going into the clinic with uh, autologous cells. And again, we have tried really hard to do this in a responsible way. You know, there are lots of comments about autologous cells are the child's own. It's no brainer. You can give them. They should be safe. But the truth is, what we want to know if they work. And um, again, in a disease like cerebral palsy, it's not as easy as treating a child with a malignancy where you know it works or not. So we've worked hard to do a study, which is a randomized placebo-controlled blinded crossover trial in children with cerebral palsy. Uh, who had an, a qualified autologous cord blood unit and had documented etiology for their CP um, by a stroke in utero, periventricular leukomalacia, which is what affects premature babies or hypoxic injury. And we used an endpoint called the GMFCS um, level and scale, which is a validated measure for uh, looking at motor function in children with cerebral palsy. And this measure allows you to predict by age and level of severity of CP, which is what's shown in these graphs, if a child starts at whatever age it is, where they're going to be in a year. And we used an endpoint of positive response was the child was 30% better or more than they would have predicted to be, be, be um, doing at that time point. So um, just quickly, um, I'll talk more about this in a couple, uh, yet tomorrow, actually. But we did find a positive result. Um, and it was related um, not only to treatment, but to cell dose. And the children who got a cell dose more than 25 million per kilo from the pre-cryo dose or 20 million per kilo from the post-thaw dose had improvement in motor function. And this was not dependent on age or severity of CP um, or type of CP. So we now want to take this for forward. But I'll mention that it took us four years to accrue 63 children. 
Um, and um, we don't think it's possible in the autologous setting to do a large randomized phase three trial, but it'll take us 40 years to accrue those patients. So we're looking at other strategies to take this forward. This is a biomarker. Rob talked about biomarkers. Um, this is brain connectivity and the three scans on the top. These are overlays of baseline and one-year scans. Red means increased fibers. Blue means decreased fibers. Three kids on the top were in the high cell dose group and had increased evidence of brain connectivity at their one-year scan. The three kids in the bottom group were in the placebo or low cell dose group and did not have any improvement. And this correlated with their GMFM score, which changed more than 10 points in the top group and did not change in the lower group. So we think we have a biomarker to take this forward as well, which is good to have validation of our clinical observations. Um, again, because we know most patients are not going to have autologous cells, uh, we are motivated, assuming our results continue to confirm what we're observing here, to make allogeneic cells work without chemotherapy. And the way we're doing that is to establish safety in an adult study with, of adults with ischemic stroke getting unmatched cord blood from uh, public banks. And if safety is confirmed there, we just started a sibling trial in kids with CP. And if safety is confirmed there, we'll go ahead and do a, boast, a best donor trial. So what are our challenges? You know, we, we've developed concepts based on clinical needs, and I think that's really important um, in translational medicine. Um, but access to patient and rare disorders makes it limiting in terms of the scope of studies that can be done. Um, qualification of source materials was a challenge for us because we weren't using cells from our own bank. We were using cells from family banks all over the world, and some were qualified more um, uh, rigorously than others, and we had to develop our own criteria where we felt that we had a safe product. In rare disorders, like I'm showing you with that intrathecal therapy in kids with leukodystrophies, we will never have enough cell, enough patients to do even randomized phase two trials. So we have to figure out how you can responsibly bring a therapy like that to the clinic if it's safe, but efficacy is very difficult to evaluate. The endpoints, as I mentioned, are complicated. And um, preclinical studies are hard to correlate with the actual human outcomes. So questions I would say, and I think we can talk about later, is what constitutes um, sufficient preclinical data? And if a cell's already been tested in humans for homologous use, what if any testing for safety is required for non-homologous use? Um, and um, you know, how can promising therapies for rare and orphan diseases reach the clinic? And how do we manage these complicated efficacy endpoints? So I'm going to stop. I need to say and want to say that it takes a village per Hillary Clinton to do this work. Um, I'm telling you about it, but there are literally hundreds of people in, on my teams who have worked with me for over a couple of decades. Many of them are listed here as our co-investigators. Um, we have funding from several foundations um, that are also listed um, at the bottom of the slide. And I specifically want to acknowledge our patients because uh, they are really the heroes of the story. The picture is three kids that came with me to testify at the FDA hearing for public cord blood banking a couple of years ago. And um, they all, the little girl in the blue shirt, had Crabbe and was transplanted with an unrelated donor cord blood unit when she was 19 days old. The girl in the black shirt has hurlers and was transplanted when she was one year old. And the little boy in the plaid shirt has adrenal leukodystrophy and was transplanted when he was two and a half years old. And I think they really had powerful testimonies that helped the FDA make their decision. Um, so I'll stop there, and I think we're holding questions to the end. Thank you, Joanne, for that nice presentation. The next person on our panel is Dr. Jan Nolta, and uh, Dr. Jan Nolta really needs no introduction. She's the Stem Cell Program Director at UC Davis. She has been a pioneer in the area of stem cell research, doing a lot of work, not only in her research, but also growing the institute there at uh, UC Davis and the Air Force in Regenerative Medicine. Jan also is the editor of Stem Cells, a sister journal to Stem Cells Translational Medicine. Again, both publications out of Alphamed Press, thanking them again for their sponsorship of this panel. Thank you, Jan. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. Well, I am delighted to be here. 
Thank you to um, Alan and Bernie and the entire symphony that made this happen. I, I love this meeting. Thank you especially to Alpha Med Press and Ann Murphy, who's with us today, who with her um, amazing husband, Marty Murphy, started the journal Stem Cells 33 years ago. And uh, I, I consider myself very lucky to be the editor of that uh, journal. And then our, uh, our new sibling journal, uh, Stem Cells Translational Medicine, has only been around a couple years, and I just have to mention has had a really meteoric rise in popularity with the second impact factor coming in at 5.7. So really proud, really proud of that journal. Okay, I'm going to talk about um, mesenchymal stem or stromal cells, my favorite stem cell. I've been having a, a love affair with these cells for 30 years. I can't believe it's that long now. And the next generation MSC therapies which means um, genetically engineering the uh, MSCs to give them additional properties or putting them in a matrix, which I really don't have uh, too much time to discuss. We have a large stem cell program at UC Davis. So over 150 uh, faculty investigators and their teams. This shows the different teams. The um, green arrows are showing a team that has a human uh, cell therapy regenerative medicine uh, clinical trial ongoing or recently completed and the red ones are where we are currently um, in discussion with the food and drug administration to begin a novel trial and the uh, rainbow our favorite our favorite type of arrow um, the rainbows have um, whoops sorry thought that was a pointer. The um, rainbows have um, IND approval, but we're still going through our IRB, our institutional approval. And I uh, just have to say that most of the teams are in some way using mesenchymal stem cells. So very important uh, workhorse uh, cell for us. And I'm going to talk about what they can and cannot do today. So these are some methods for um, therapeutic stem cell and gene therapy options. As I mentioned, I started uh, genetically engineering MSCs. Uh, we called them marrow stromal cells back then in uh, 1987, uh, almost 30 years ago. And it's been a, a long uh, path to the clinic. And we know now things that they um, can do and things that they really cannot do. So for gene therapy, adding a normal gene copy to restore function, um, the hematopoietic stem cells are currently the best for long-term therapy. And so I, I trained uh, with Donald Cohn at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, uh, several of our team did. And Don has used uh, hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy to functionally cure 23 kids with ADA deficiency now. So very uh, proud of that work that we started back in the early 90s and he's gone forward with. So if you want a cell that will be around for the rest of a child's life, um, the hematopoietic cells making, like uh, Joanne talked about, making the normal uh, copy of the gene uh, from an allo transplant or uh, gene modified cells from, from, the, from the child um, or from the patient are, are the best way to go. Cell replacement strategies, um, there is transplantation of healthy progenitors capable of differentiation into the tissue of interest. MSCs can do this for um, bone, really, they're, they're very good at bone. But for the others, uh, jury's still out. Transplantation of gene-modified patient uh, iPSC-derived cells, which I believe Mahendra will address, is um, really the, the promising um, field here. Now, for gene modification or correction, we need to um, silence silencing or gene editing for a dominant mutant allele. I'll be talking this afternoon in a panel about uh, gene editing. MSCs can carry the cargo that can uh, mediate the, uh, the, the uh, gene editing, which is an interesting uh, thing that we're working on now uh, for Huntington's disease and other applications. And they're best known, the MSCs are best known for tissue healing, so they're very good at promoting angiogenesis and uh, neurogenesis and enhancing neural connectivity. So MSCs are known to secrete trophic factors that promote healing over inflammation and scarring, and they are very uh, easily gene modified. So they can be very uh, easily genetically engineered to produce protein and other factors for delivery into target cells and tissues in the body. And interestingly, delivery can be through um, the conventional secretion uh, out, outside, of, outside of their cell body uh, to be taken up by other receptors or through direct transfer 
via tunneling nanotubules, exosomes, and microparticles. And I'll show you two videos in just a minute. And then in that way, factors normally confined to the cell cytoplasm can be transferred to uh, target cells. So if we could start this uh, video, please. These are uh, human, uh oh, there we go, okay. Human MSCs um, moving around in a dish and interacting with one another. You can see um, if you concentrate on the top uh, right uh, quadrant. Right now, uh, those cells have just uh, joined forces through a tunneling nanotubule and uh, transferred a bunch of mitochondria. The cell, um, it's hard to not have a pointer, the cell right in the, in the middle of the upper quadrant right there is releasing right now a bunch of microparticles that then got snapped up by the cell below it, and that cell divides. One of the things that comes through these tunneling nanotubules are new mitochondria. They're transferred from cell to cell. Uh, the MSCs are very good at infusing them into damaged cells or dying cells to keep those cells alive. And you can see where those long uh, filaments, the tunneling nanotubules, are stretching between the cells. You can see the little globs uh, passing between and that is, that is the uh, mitochondria passing. Everything else that was inside that cell's cytoplasm is um, passing through as well. So it's very interesting. If we could start this one, please. These are MSCs labeled in red and muscle cells, uh, myoblasts labeled in green. You can see the amount of interaction between the two cell types, the uh, microparticles that are visible that are left behind the cells, and just the amount of um, sharing that's going on um, largely from the uh, MSCs uh, toward the myoblast. Sorry. It's usually uh, very smooth. Hopefully when we have the, have the video of this, we can get a, get a smooth copy up there for you. Okay. This um, paper was just published in uh, human, uh, human Gene Therapy, and the video is online, so if anybody's interested, I, I'm happy to send it to you. I've tweeted it as well. So this morning... Um, there was a discussion, uh, some discussion about um, adipose tissue and these clinics that are springing up um, and when to use it and when, when uh, not to use it and how to use fat responsibly. Of course, the plastic surgeons are really uh, leading this uh, forefront, doing it responsibly. This paper came out in uh, Stem Cells Translational Medicine, Our Fat Future Translating Adipose uh, Stem Cell Therapy. It really discusses a lot about the field, so this is a, a um, Great review that I would recommend. There is a FDA guidance out about how to uh, handle uh, adipose uh, MSCs, adipose stem cells. Um, what is minimal manipulation? What is uh, when can you do a same day procedure and minimally manipulate the cells? And so that's um, all very important to consider. Also a, a session on it today. There's been, uh, there have been a few um, recent successes in the MSC field. So Tygenix announced um, that their product, their uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cell product, met primary endpoint in a pivotal phase three trial with uh, robust uh, statistical um, significance in the phase three. And of course, uh, their stocks jumped up that day, so good success. And then there's been a really nice uh, meta-analysis showing a MSC infusion is a viable option for treatment of GVHD. And so they uh, did the meta-analysis of the trials that have been done to date, um, showing survival at six months for patients with severe steroid refractory graft-versus-host disease. And usually the survival is incredibly low for those patients. And I just wanted to mention that um, Mesoblast's MSC product, uh, Temcel, for GVHD, this is an IV infusion, is approved for uh, reimbursement in Japan as, as of last month. Another advance. And this is that paper um, in the Lancet Hematology with the meta-analysis. So challenges in producing MSCs for clinical use. Um, people are using different culture systems, so it's sometimes hard to generalize. Um, and to compare from um, one trial to the next. Although in the meta-analysis, it didn't really matter how the cells had been cultured or what passage they were, interestingly. There's different um, cell handling that is causing uh, inconsistency in trial outcomes at some point, at some point. Um, human platelet lysate versus bovine serum is a, is a huge uh, factor. 
There's inability to scale up a large enough batch to treat significant numbers of patients without driving cells towards senescence. That's a huge problem. These are not immortalized cells. They're not cells that grow forever like embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells can. So they are, um, they are limited in their number of divisions they can go through. And then finally, um, <clears throat> Infusion or implantation immediately after thawing, uh, we now know hinders cell survival and performance in vivo and can result in short duration or engraftment. And that's something that the field is really battling with because, um, of course, it's easiest to thaw the cells and immediately infuse them, but the MSCs don't handle that very well. So at UC Davis, we've um, modified our manufacturing scheme to have a thaw and precondition step after the um, manufacturing and uh, genetic engineering. When the patient is um, slated to come to the clinic, uh, we will thaw and precondition the cells for 48 hours in hypoxia, um, <clears throat> formulate into the syringes, and we will be uh, shipping the cells uh, in the syringes ready to inject for the MDs. And that's based um, on, the, on the thawing data that we have and the um, and the stability in the syringes and showing that um, pre-culturing pre human MSCs at 1% oxygen for 48 hours prior to implantation enhances in vivo retention. So if you look at the graph on the, on the bottom, um, these are MSCs injected into the muscle of the mice and then looking by uh, uh, IVUS um, in vitro imaging system over uh, weeks of time. The purple spot is the surviving MSCs. At 20% at oxygen, the cells are gone by uh, two weeks. And with uh, the preconditioning step, we still have good levels of them. About 10% um, are still there at one month. And then by PCR, we can detect them out to about four and a half months, and then they're gone after that. So this is an important thing about MSCs. Even with the best um, standard of practice of injecting, they are a, a temporary cell type. And so we, we are using them to deliver factors and to deliver um, growth factors that might cause angiogenesis or neurogenesis over that duration uh, that they are in the tissue. We are doing uh, large-scale cellular manufacturing in our GMP facility. So uh, using the Terumo bioreactor, this is a hollow fiber bioreactor, and this is comparing uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, cassettes versus the uh, traditional 10 layer cell factory that takes a lot of uh, manpower to get the cells to come out uh, just the same. And finally, this takes a huge amount of teamwork. We um, thank everyone on our team that works in the Institute for Regenerative Cures. We have a number of cores. Um, we have a booth downstairs that has our uh, list of our IND enabling studies that we can do on a fee-for-service basis for uh, academic or um, industry partners. And these are the people that uh, run all the cores and the vivarium and the humanized mouse facility and uh, work, work at the bench every day. And thank you for your attention. It's been great to be here. Thank you, Jan, for that nice presentation. Our next speaker in the panel is Dr. Mahendra Rao. Uh, again, Mahendra needs no introduction for our field. He was the scientist who established the very first effort at the National Institutes of Health uh, for Regenerative Medicine and was in charge of the Center for Regenerative Medicine at the NIH from its inception till just uh, last year. And he's now spending a lot of his time between the New York Stem Cell Institute and uh, other activities that he's doing on, his, on behalf of the field. So it's been a great pleasure to see Mahendra really lead the field in so many areas, especially the area of uh, iPS cells. So it's great to have you here with us, Mahendra. Good to see you. So I'm going to be really brief, and I'm going to show you only four slides. I'm going to start by telling you that we talk, call these alpha stem clinics not because the Alpha Medical Press supported this effort, but alpha because these will be the people who will be on the cutting edge in terms of being able to try and get these uh, therapies to the clinic. And you heard from Joanne about there is a process in place. There are physicians who know how to recruit patients, they know how to be able to make cells, and they know how to be able to deliver them, and se several patients have been treated. And you heard from Jen that uh, there is a process which will require that some cells will have to be manufactured. 
and that manufacturing will require them to be expanded and grown in some fashion before they can be used. And she gave you examples from MSC in being able to do that. So I'm going to just list what issues there are with trying to think about IPSC as you move forward towards the clinic. And so I'm going to start off by saying that not many people have been treated with IPSC cells or with ESC cells. There have been five approved clinical trials by the FDA and one patient who has been treated with iPSC cells, so for a total number of patients, which would be less than 50. And in each case, we've learned a lot on what needs to be done and what the issues are when we start considering them. So the one big thing that we've learned from all of this is that there are going to be probably three different ways that people are going to think about iPSC-based cell therapy or ESC-based cell therapy. You're going to think about cells which have to be matched, and you heard about HLA matching because the cells will not persist otherwise in being able to do that. Or you will have to think about allogenic cells if you're going to put them in a place or, or where they are immune privileged or where you don't require immune suppression or, the, or you only require hit and run therapy. And there's an intermediate here where you can HLA match so that you're really using allogenic cells, but you're selecting a subset of cells that you'll have to do, uh, which will be HLA matched before you can put them in, akin to what you heard from Joanne in terms of cord blood, where you match with HLA for either related donors or from unrelated donors to be able to do it, or when you do bone marrow transplants. So what that means, though, is that you now have to consider a model whoops, for therapy, which is a little bit different than what we have considered for other cell types. IPSC are not the final end product. They are the input material for manufacturing a product. So you have to imagine that, and many different IPSC lines will probably be used for therapy. So what you can imagine is that there will be IPSC or PSC or ESC cell-based banks. And those banks will be starting material or input material for manufacture of a final product. And that final product can be many. So the same starting sample could be used for making neural cells or making hepatocytes or making cardiomyocytes and make, making them at different times and probably by different manufacturers. So really a two-stage process, and then the end product will then be shipped to an alpha clinic where then it will be used under an appropriate BLA license. So you're going to have separate specific issues which in this particular process of manufacture which are different from what you've heard about some of the other cell types. And I'm just going to highlight them in the next slide and point this out for IPSC. So what's pretty clear is that unlike MSC, IPSC are not an allogenic therapy which can be used for integration of cells because they're not immune privileged in the same way and the cells get rejected, even in uh, the brain where you see at least a chronic rejection phenomenon. If you have HLA match, you're going to require a really large number of samples. So any manufacturing process that you put up or any alpha clinic which has to treat them has to have access to a really large number of samples. I want to emphasize this point really truly here because this is really going to be important there's not enough CGMP capacity in the world currently to make all the lines that would theoretically be required for such therapy. So this is a really important need. IPSC manufacture require, to make a differentiated product doesn't take three days or five days or seven days. You generally talk about weeks and months, right, to be able to make a product. You'll hear about RPE in a parallel session here. It's 28 weeks to make one product. So we don't have that capacity and CGMP facilities to be able to make that many products if you have to do this on a really commercial scale. So we have to do that. We have to worry about that. The cost of making a line and the time required to make that line makes this very expensive therapy unless we figure out ways in working with the regulators to reduce the cost or we will not be able to treat a large number of diseases. So that's the really important thing that we have to make sure about. Cells that are made from IPSC are generally immature, so they may not be good enough to use for certain diseases, and we have to very carefully evaluate the properties of the cells to see whether they'll be functionally useful. For example, we have found that the cells that we transplant for Parkinson's disease in models require at least four weeks in rodents to mature before they are functionally useful to be able to do that. This has huge implications on how you conduct clinical trials and how much of a follow-up you'll have and when will there be beneficial activity. In fact, for the, with fetal cell transplants, what was done in Parkinson's disease, with the three major studies that were done, it was considered that they'd failed to meet the primary endpoints. 
Now that we followed those patients up for a longer time period, you'd see that they've met all the, time point, uh, all the efficacy time points that had been set for success. So the difference between success and failure in a trial depends on how long you wait. And with these cells, it may be necessary to wait longer than we had uh, normally assumed. But that means there are many implications in design and cost that we have to really worry about. And remember then, iPSC are this odd beast in some fashion. We just said that you really need to have HLA matched, so autologous or H, uh, you know, allogenic HLA matched cells. But the only model we have for autologous cells that we've normally used is cells which are not manufactured and they have been sort of grandfather or it's bone marrow transplant. So we've got a manufactured autologous cell product which is going to be regulated in some fashion. And so we have really major implications on how this will be done and how the regulations will be applied to even make this therapy feasible. So that's the sort of particular reality that we have and special issues that we have for iPSC-based therapy. And we need to solve this. And as you heard, it takes a village to solve these questions. It's, you have to work with the regulators, the manufacturers have to work with uh, you to make sure about the cost, the clinics have to design the clinical trials appropriately to be able to make that all work. And so I'll end there for solutions and just say that we need to develop appropriate banking regulations for IPSC banks. We need to change regulations relating to manufacture of cells while maintaining safety. We need to introduce the concept of comparability if you're going to make thousands of lines because you can't test each of them as a different product. And we need to consider different trial designs to be able to do that. I'll stop here and be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Mahendra. I guess we'll go ahead and open it to uh, questions from the audience first, and then uh, uh, see if we have more questions for the panel. Yes, Jenny. Yeah, this is Jane Loring. Um, so, Mahendra, I, you know what I've when I'm doing, I'm working on autologous therapy for Parkinson's disease, and the cost is really a concern. But I'm wondering when when I'm trying to do to sort of rationalize it is use an analogy to the CAR T therapies which are also individual therapies that, and I know it costs a lot, nobody will tell me how much it is. But, um, but that has been quite successful. Now the difference is that you're treating a, a terminal disease in one case, and the other case, uh, people can live with Parkinson's for a long period of time. But I'm wondering if the CAR-T therapies may set a precedent for how much a, a therapy that really works uh, can cost. <laughs> I'll just use this because, you know, and actually maybe Joanne is the better person to answer this question, but, <laughs> you know, when you have a commercial product, there's two parts to getting approval, right? There's what, how will you price it, and there's a review board which tells you what the pricing can be. And so you have to prepare a whole casework to be able to make that justification. And that is related to current cost of therapy. So for Parkinson's, for example, it would be very hard to justify charging $50,000 even to treat a patient who's responsive to dopamine because the drug costs $2.50 for a month month supply, right, to be able to do it. You also have, if your benefit in, in Parkinson's is not more than when you do deep brain stimulation, for example, and it's the same time period of persistence or durability, then your cost, it's hard to justify a cost which is significantly more than what they charge for it, which they went through a whole review process to doing it. So you have to show what the benefit is to the community as a whole in terms of treating that patient in terms of the cost to the healthcare system, mm -hmm. and you have to show what the changes are to the quality of life for the patient in terms of what that does, and those numbers then vary. If you save the life of a person, that, then it's very different, but if I take a person with spinal cord injury and I improve the quality of life, say that they can get from a wheelchair themselves rather than having to have assistance, then it's very hard for the system to justify how much you can charge for that particular kind of therapy, even though it's a huge benefit for the patient. And so those discussions have to occur, and they occur at some particular stage as you get forward with your therapy. But I would recommend everybody look at this because this is exactly what happened with some of the companies which assumed they could charge a certain amount, and they found uh, doctors were either not willing to prescribe that medication or patients were not willing to take that medication because they, in their mind the cost benefit wasn't adequate. So, so it's a tough thing, but it has to I'm, be done. I'm gonna remain optimistic that. <laughs> yes. I have to make one comment. I mean, why not say, instead of figuring out all these kind of devious ways, I think, to 
jack up the cost. Why not say it costs this much fully loaded to make whatever it is, and it's legitimate to have a small margin above that, and that's the cost. And then say to hospitals, you can't you know, uh, change that or increase it because you're modeling against cost recovery, which they all do. Um, but, but there really is a true cost with a small margin, and that's the end of the story. Right. Yeah, I understand that. The trouble is that if, um, as we are being encouraged, we get involved with for-profit biotech companies, yeah. we have to deal with the venture capitalists, which is why I'm not doing that. Not until we show efficacy, because I, I don't want the cost to be uh, controlled by somebody's uh, desire for profit. Thanks, Jean. We'll go ahead and get to the next question then from uh, Dustin Wakeman, Rush University. My question's for Dr. Nolta. You mentioned you had these preloaded needles. Hi, Jen. You mentioned you had these preloaded needles. I wondered if you could comment on that process and some of the talks that went on with the FDA. Um, I guess, from my perspective, IPS That's sales for, for Parkinson's, how we might be able to then transfer that over to other diseases. Yeah, thanks, Dustin. Um, we are just uh, getting ready to submit that manuscript, actually. So we've done all of the work in our GMP facility. And that has been through the um, FDA as far as our pre-IND meeting. And they didn't have a, a problem with it. But we haven't gotten through the final IND yet. So as soon as uh, we get that accepted, I'll send it over to you. Sounds great. Thanks. It's, it's pretty standard stuff. It's just you know when to exactly do each step. Terrific, thank you. So, uh, so Mahendra, being that we are discussing, uh, you know, being at the precipice, you know, briefly from your perspective, what would you say are some of the challenges in terms of uh, human embryonic stem cells and using those currently in the field? So the single, well, the two big problems with the embryonic stem cell field in my mind. One is, the regulations because of ethical concerns that were there and there's no clarity on those regulations. So we don't know which line can be used, whether they were corrected in an appropriate way and there's a really a logical disconnect between the donor consent rule for embryonic stem cell collection and when you have to do it. So you have to go for an exemption with each line that you go to the FDA to get approval for. And then you have this problem that even if I make a product from a particular ESC line, it's not going to be internationally approved in all countries. So I have a market that's very fragmented and it's a nightmare when to figure out whether I can ship to a particular place or not, if a patient comes from one place or not, that I can do it. And so those are sort of the additional problems that I have with embryonic stem cells, which I don't have with other cell types. So that's what makes it much more difficult. Sounds good. Let's move then to iPS cells. I'll, I'll direct the question again to you, and then we'll move on to some of the other cell types. What do you think in terms of challenges right now for iPS cells, bringing it to the next level for the field? So the, the single biggest challenge is cost. So everything else, really, iPS cells are like any other cell, right? And we have experience with, as you heard from Jan, in manufacturing cells, and we have experience in growing cells in really large numbers that you may need. So the cost problem with iPS cells is that it, the, long pro, the manufacturing process is long. You have to worry about the quality of the cells because you're now differentiating them in multiple steps that are required to get the differentiation process to work. And so those all add significantly to cost. And if the cells take a long time to mature after you transplant them, your clinical trial cost is going to be higher, larger as well. So all in all, if you had to ask me what's the single biggest issue with iPS cells, it's cost. So. Very good. Thanks for that answer. We'll move to Joanne then, because Joanne, you've been, of course, working with core blood for so many years. What do you think, in your, uh, from your perspective, what are the challenges to get those cells now again to go further into the treatment of rheumatarium for our patients? So cost is a big <laughs> barrier. Um, Public cordless banks all are not financially profitable, and they somehow struggle along with various types of cobbling together support. But 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 it's um, not a money maker, and um, the uh, regulatory uh, infrastructure is complicated. Um, even today, dealing with some of the challenges with the BLA, where there's 
I think still not total understanding between the FDA um, and the transplant community about what kinds of systems are already in place to get follow-up data and and to control product quality. Um, you know, cord blood, and when you talked about iPSCs, cord blood is a single unit product, but there are hundreds of thousands of them banked. And again, as Jan was saying, and as, as Mahindra was saying, you can't test every single one, so you have to develop sort of broad uh, quality parameters that should predict that each individual unit um, will perform, but, but isn't 100%. Um, I think in terms of taking cord blood into other applications, it, it gets stuck at least in the question of uh, non-homologous use of a product that has a lot of experience for homologous use and where do you draw the line and what kind of safety do you need and if comparability, as Mahindra was saying, was established, I think products could get to the clinic more quickly, um, but that's not there right now. And of course, one of the challenges is what you mentioned, right? You're talking about one core blood unit per patient, right? right? So each time you have to go through that process of, 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 that, of actually processing those cells and making sure they're there. But if it's non-autologous, then you're talking about uh, also some of the expansion issues, right? Yeah. Uh, also, you're still dealing with uh, one core blood unit. Right, so it's one unit for one patient, at least in today's use, regardless of whether it's autologous or it's allogeneic. And expansion of hematopoietic cells is looking very promising, but expansion of other types of cells is really in its infancy, and, and the technology is not mature. Sounds good. Uh, uh, Mahendra, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I, again I want to or? add one thing, and Jen, you should tell me if you agree with this. So I see one other big problem for the cord blood banks, and that is the fact that you have to worry about whether units which were collected before you got a license are going to be grandfathered or not, or what, what is the issue with them, and what is the time period in which you have to use up those units or not. I think that's yeah. going to be an important issue. And the other really equally important issue is this sort of divide between public and private banks. So public banks are regulated, private banks are not regulated. But now, if you're going to think of autologous therapy, it's only going to come from the private banks, right? What do you do as you move forward, right, if they now have to get regulated because they're now manufacturing a product? If you don't get clarity on how that is going to happen or what are the steps there, I think we're going to have a big problem for the field. So, I don't so the, know. So, no, I totally agree. The baby steps we took with that because we faced that problem in our autologous trials is we developed our own internal qualification scheme and the FDA agreed with it and in our INDs at least and we couldn't accept all products um, but going forward it's, there's a huge imbalance between licensed banks and unlicensed banks on the public side and there's no even though there's licensure it's not mandated yet so for all public banks so that's created confusion so we don't know the lifespan of the product. We don't know if it expires, so that creates confusion, even if the older inventory is under IND. Um, currently, it can be used, but, but the, the rules are unclear, and the future is unclear. So Thanks. this comparability assay is going to be really critical that Joanne highlighted. You know, the assay is correct. That will be very assay. important. Yeah. Well, you know, Jan, uh, thanks for that comment, uh, both Joanne and, and Mahendra. Jan, let's talk about, you know, bone marrow. As you know, bone marrow, of course, can go in uh, two directions, MSCs, hematopoietic use, obviously two totally different applications. What are, from your perspective, what do you see as some of the challenges for the future? Well, the, you know, for bone marrow, the, the, the opportunities and the challenges are similar to what Joanne was describing for the for the cord blood stem cells for the for the hematopoietic stem cells because they provide the same functions for blood restoration. Um, for the MSCs from bone marrow or from fat, the huge challenge is to there's a lot of donor to donor variability, and we need to define very um, well delineated potency assays for every disorder we're trying to treat. Um, for instance, we have a <clears throat> MSC BDNF product that we're taking forward um, to treat Huntington's disease. Um, it's, a, it's a temporary treatment, it's not a cure. Um, it's to cause new neurogenesis in the brain and enhance neural connections. And so as the potency assay for that, we have a neurite outgrowth um, 
bioassay that we would do in the lab to define that that's a good, a good batch of MSCs. And then, of course, they're greatly expanded. You need to test them at the end as well. Um, we test them up front to make sure that they qualify to go forward. We test them at the end to make sure that they're still a, a good donor and a good batch. Um, we have a, a MSC VEGF uh, product for angiogenesis. We do similar uh, in vitro angiogenic assays. And of course, there are the factors that they secrete. And I thought it was very interesting that in that meta-analysis, it didn't really matter how the cells had been cultured because people have different ways in different cultures. And for that indication, which is um, suppressing the, the immune system, uh, immune modulation, it seems that the cultured MSCs always do some degree. And I think that's why that came out that way. So um, unless you culture them really badly, uh, which they did not for those trials, um, they always make a certain, a certain number of immunomodulatory uh, cytokines, which are, is very interesting. But we have, you know, we'll test eight donors, and four of them will be really good at making VEGF without engineering, and the others don't really make much. Um, and so really uh, defining the best donors, defining the best batches, developing well-defined potency assays, and really sharing standard operating procedures and sharing these potency assays with others will help the field move forward. Yes, one of the challenges, you know, uh, is that when you're talking about potency assays, of course, we still don't know a lot about the mechanisms of action and what really is uh, providing the effect in the patient. So how do we get around some well, of this these challenges? Is, yeah, this, this is how it's been learned over the years that um, MSCs don't respond as well uh, coming out of the freezer, being thawed, spun down, and put into the patient. They don't do as well as hematopoietic cells do. Hematopoietic cells are able to, I don't know, get rid of the DMSO and lodge and find the bone marrow after you put them in IV. MSCs, not so much. They're really damaged by the freezing. They need a recovery phase. They need to be ready. You know, they're ad adherence-dependent cells. They need to be ready to adhere and go back into the tissues of interest. And so only by using the in vivo models after the manufacture and surrogate in vivo models, we have a lot of nice, um, for instance, immune deficient mice models now and humanized mouse models. And also looking at the large animal models with the animal MSCs, we can learn really a lot about how to handle the cells prior to implantation or infusion and what the, how that is all going to affect the end product. Very good, thank you for that comment. Let's say, let's talk about just briefly then. Uh, One question. About, we do have a question from the audience, but uh, let's go ahead and take that question then. Thank you, uh, Hector Mayani from Mexico City. Um, I have a question regarding the process of taking stem cells into therapy. Uh, basic scientists would like to see the process from in vitro studies to animal studies and then clinical trials and that may take a long time. Patients, millions of patients, want therapy, I mean, stem cell-based therapies today. They want them available today. So I would like to know your opinion about how to reach the, the, the appropriate balance between those two positions, one that may take, I don't know, 10, 15 years, the other one that want the, the, the therapy right now. Who, who should set the pace for taking stem cells into therapy? Uh, uh, science or, or the society, scientists, the patients, how to find this balance? I, I work a lot with patient advocates and no matter how badly they want the therapy, we cannot do the therapies in the United States unless it's FDA approved. So the FDA sets the pace, absolutely. And it's really great that um, they've been inviting these patient advocate groups to the FDA to um, talk to them and so that they can learn more about the, about the patient's needs and about the um, possible risks that the patients are willing to take. There's always the risk versus benefit. And they're, um, they're really listening to the patients about the risks that they, that they might want to take. And then Joanne has worked a lot with patient advocate groups. Maybe you want to say something? Uh, like I think it's a real struggle. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer. I think it's really, really hard to have a patient in front of you who's looking for a solution and uh, who wants you to test something that might not be ready to be tested. And it's, it's hard to manage that <laughs> no matter which side of the fence and which decision you make. I don't think we have the best system yet. I, I think 
we can't be reckless and put things into patients that are risky, and many patients understand that when you take the time to exp explain it. But I also think we take too long sometimes to get things to the clinic, and I wish there were ways to expedite those processes more than we can do today. Terrific. I know we have to wrap up the panel, so I'm just going to finish the panel with one last question to each of you, uh, which is basically we know, of course, we talked about the challenges. We know that some of these therapies have proven to be useful in patients. So from your perspective, each of you, give me one thing that you see as the promise of the field for your specific cell type that you're working with. Joanne? Oh, one thing. Well, I, I'm most excited right now about the potential for cord blood cells and probably cord tissue cells to ameliorate neurologic damage. Terrific. Certainly a good evidence behind that. Um, Mahendra, what about from your perspective with IPS cells? So, you know, you heard Joanne's story about Fanconi's anemia, and, and you heard about uh, Jan's idea about you can do ex vivo gene therapy with cells. I think IPSC are the ideal candidate for that, right? You can do, get cells from the per person, you can do ex vivo gene therapy, you can differentiate the appropriate type that will go into the first person, and you'll be able to treat that patient with an effective cure for something that you already have a model for. So to me, that's what I'm most excited about, is autologous iPSC-based gene replacement therapy. Terrific. Thank you, Mahendra. And Jan? Well, MSCs are used for a host of indications, um, some successful, some not successful. You just need to understand what they can and cannot do um, to best design the trial. So for me, you know, I've been working on MSC gene therapy for a long time, so having them now delivering factors and even um, delivering gene editing factors um, to the target cells and the possibility of them delivering gene editing um, cargo into cells in situ, um, like into the brain or into the spinal cord, is really uh, the, the big frontier for me and really exciting. And I'll be talking about that this afternoon a little bit. Terrific. Thank you, Jan. I'd like to thank the entire panel for their wonderful participation. Joanne Kurtzberg, Mahendra Rao, Jan Nolta, thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you, thank you for hosting. <laughs>